In the early 2010s, there seemed to be no stopping Grey Maynard. The bully lived up to his mantle by steamrolling his way to the cusp of UFC gold, only for two of the greatest fights of all time to send his career into a terminal decline. Today we look at how MMA's bully became the victim. Welcome to the INC, and today we ask, what happened to Grey Maynard? Wrestling was in Bradley Grey Maynard's blood from the very beginning. His father Jan had been a two-time Ohio State wrestling champion, and it didn't take long for the younger Maynard to follow in his father's footsteps, becoming a Division I All-American at Michigan State University, where he was a roommate of future UFC champion Rashad Evans. While his bully moniker was a reference to his beloved Bull Terrier, it came to symbolize Maynard's fighting style, using tenacity and brute strength to overwhelm his opponents. And by the time of his graduation, he'd racked up 106 wins, the 11th most in state history. After failing to make the US Olympic wrestling team in 2004, Maynard considered walking away from combat sports, until he was recruited as a sparring partner for BJ Penn for his match with Rodrigo Gracie. The experience inspired Maynard to pursue a career in MMA, and thanks to his wrestling connections, was taken under the wing of UFC legend Randy Couture, making his pro debut on April 21, 2006. It didn't take long for Maynard to find admirers. After just two fights on the regional scene, the fighter received a call for the UFC's reality show, The Ultimate Fighter, making it to the semifinals before losing to eventual champion Nate Diaz. Maynard was still invited to compete on the show's finale that June, but his match with Rob Emerson was marred by one of the most infamous finishes in company history. Gray gets a hold of him, lifts him up, bang, and ducks right him, and lands yeah. on his own head, knocks himself unconscious. Maynard was still granted a UFC contract a few months later, and quickly made up for the faux pas with an eight-fight winning streak over the next three years. Highlights include avenging his loss to Nate Diaz and a decision win over unbeaten rookie Frankie Edgar. While Maynard's performances were commended, they failed to win over a fan base, many seeing his grappling heavy style as a turnoff in an increasingly casual focused sport. By the time he beat Kenny Florian at UFC 118, Maynard's claim to a title fight couldn't be ignored, with the bully receiving his first crack at company gold at UFC 125 where he'd square off against a familiar face from his past. Following his loss to Maynard, Frankie Edgar had retooled his game to that of a darting striker, building a four-fight winning streak that culminated in his upset title win over BJ Penn. It set the stage for a compelling dynamic, the rookie champion facing an unbeaten powerhouse who happened to be the only man to ever beat him. Fans in Las Vegas expected a compelling, fast-paced encounter, what followed surpassed even those expectations. Oh, big time. Frankie tried to spin out of trouble. Maynard chased him down. Maynard dropped Edgar multiple times during a one-sided first round, only for the New Jersey fighter to recover and mount a dramatic fight back after Maynard gassed himself attempting to finish the bout. The final three rounds saw a showcase of striking prowess and momentum shifts, with many fans voting it as their fight of the year and one of the greatest in company history. Nothing could separate the two come the end of the fifth round. It turned out that fans weren't the only ones divided on the victor. And 47-47, this fight is considered a draw! The match marked the first draw in a UFC title fight for nine years, and added with the quality of the bout, a trilogy between the two seemed inevitable. Originally planned for UFC 130, the fight instead took place six months later, with Maynard entering the match as a slight underdog. Maynard started the fight the same way he did the second, rocking Edgar with an uppercut and pouring the pressure on his ailing opponent, before Edgar rallied over the next two rounds as Maynard struggled to keep pace with the Tom Rivers fighter. Edgar's team had noticed Maynard's tendency to drop his hands leaving wrestling exchanges, and after several failed attempts, the answer finally broke through late in the fourth round. The fight marked the first loss of Maynard's career, the bully finally succumbing after 12 rounds of one of the greatest trilogies in the sport's history. It didn't take long for fans to justify the loss, Maynard had been known as one of the biggest weight cutters in the division, and some felt the dehydration added with the culmination of strikes had started to affect his durability, 
a sentiment which gained further traction later in his career. In the short term, the Edgar fights gave Maynard the fan appreciation he'd long sought, and there were curious eyes when he returned to action against Strikeforce champion Clay Guida. Guida was another man riding a wave of popularity. His wild man looks and active fighting style made him an unlikely fan favorite, with many expecting their match at Fight Night Atlantic City to be another classic. The end result, however, was underwhelming, as Guida spent the entire match circling Maynard on the outside, landing just 49 strikes as Maynard's frustration started to boil over come the end of the fourth round. And finally, Maynard's strength started to pay off a little bit here, and he is trash-talking a great Maynard we've never seen before. Maynard did enough to win the bout by split decision, but it proved a fearic victory with Dana White describing the fight as one of the worst main events in company history. By this point, Maynard had left his extreme couture training camp to join the American Kickboxing Academy, hoping the wrestling-centric gym would see a return to his early career dominance. The bully would test his credentials at UFC 160, where he faced surging contender TJ Grant in a lightweight title eliminator. Grant staggered Maynard in the opening stages and never looked back, dropping his opponent three times on his way to a first-round stoppage. Tragically, Grant would never receive his lightweight title shot, having to withdraw due to concussion symptoms and ultimately never fighting in MMA again. Things would go from bad to worse for Maynard, losing his trilogy bout to Nate Diaz before successive losses to Ross Pearson and Alexander Yakovlev. Having started his career with a 10-0 record, Maynard had now won one of his past seven fights, and the durability questions from the third Edgar bout started to become prevalent. By 2016, Maynard called time on the AKA experiment and returned to extreme couture, but it wouldn't be his most dramatic move. Despite being considered one of Lightweight's biggest fighters, Maynard announced a switch to 145 in a desperate bid to save his career. Having once been a pay-per-view main eventer, Maynard was now fighting on the prelims of the Ultimate Fighter finale, where he made his featherweight bow against UFC sophomore Fernando Bruno. Maynard returned to his grappling roots to claim a unanimous decision, his first win in the UFC for four years, before being booked against jiu-jitsu phenom Ryan Hall that December. Hall had endured a curious career since winning the Ultimate Fighter, having not fought in almost a year due to fighters turning him down because of his style. Maynard would fall into the same trap as Hall began constantly rolling to his back whenever Maynard began pressing forward, the fighter quickly losing his cool in scenes reminiscent of the Guida fight, a unanimous decision loss only adding to the bully's frustration. Maynard's final appearance came against Nick Lentz at UFC 229. On the biggest card in company history, Maynard's appearance was treated as an afterthought, as Lentz rocked Maynard with a head kick before finishing by strikes in the second round. The loss proved the final straw, as Maynard announced he'd been released by the UFC, having gone 3-7 and seven since the second Edgar fight. Maynard would continue to mix in MMA circles, securing a coaching role at Extreme Couture, where he helped guide Jessica Eyes rise to a UFC title shot including being center stage for one of the cringiest moments in company history. So I need you to chant this for me while we get our warm up, all right? We're gonna go, here we go, evil, here we go. Oh, oh. All right, ready, let's go. While other fighters in the series had downfalls which were unexplained, Maynard's decline was more telegraphed. The two Edgar fights, along with his notoriously hard sparring style, placed a significant toll on his chin, something which became amplified due to his large weight cuts. It should also be noted Maynard was 32 at the time of the Edgar bouts, and helped to make his downturn feel much more sudden in the eyes of fans. Who knows what the future holds for Maynard in the latest chapter of his career. Probably not a career in advertising. It's time to master weight an intense workout like something we've all done before. This is the INC. Please like, share, subscribe, and ring that bell so you never miss a video.